Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for being here with us today to learn how top performers use cloud financial management to improve business outcomes, and we also call that CSM. I'm Lisa Harnett, and I'm with the AWS Cloud Financial Management team, and I'm joined today by two folks from our cloud economics team. This team focuses on helping customers understand the business value of running on AWS and ensuring that they have the right processes and tools in place to manage, control, and optimize spend. Levon Stepanian focuses on cloud financial management programs at scale, such as developing training and education um, offerings, while Calvin Wu focuses on understanding trends across customers through the benchmarking studies. Each one of these talks that we have in the CFM talk series is all around answering customer, cost, common, common customer questions. And today we're talking about how those questions you ask us about what do are the best practices in this area? What CFM practices are top performing organizations using? What are the business KPIs that I can impact through doing CFM? What are my most adopted cost optimizations amongst all of your customers? How does centralized governance make a difference? What should my organization look like? How do other customers implement these processes? That's what today is all about, is how, when we talk about these best practices, where do they come from? Um, and what are our top performers actually seeing? And so today's call is all about what does good look like? And we're gonna start with a global 1000 survey that we do every year. Um, we're gonna do an overview of what's in that survey, who's in it, who's, who's part of the, the list, as well as then what are the findings around what AWS value benefits are achieved by AWS customers. And Calvin's gonna go through those too. Then we're gonna switch over to Levon and he's gonna talk about the CFM, the Cloud Financial Management top performers, top performers and what best practices they've implemented through the data and research that we've got available to us. And then we're gonna do a deep dive into the IT and finance CFM operating model. And then we'll go on to next steps and resources. As I mentioned during the brief intro um, period, there is a questions panel and you can ask questions throughout. Um, it, anytime you think of a question, go ahead and put that into that question section. And we've got people in the background who are listening for those um, and watching and can answer those. But we'll also have time at the end of this to take those questions live. So if you've got a question, we'll answer you personally, but we'll also bring some of those to the, the discussion at the end. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Calvin. Calvin? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. My name is Calvin Wu, as Lisa mentioned earlier. I, along with uh, Levon, are going to take you through the rest of our presentation today. We both come from the cloud economics team, but working in slightly different disciplines. So what we're showing here is really a typical cl customer cloud adoption journey where customers move from the discover phase where they're just really trying to understand um, you know, what cloud is, what cloud could potentially do for you and your organizations into more seriously evaluating AWS and, and what that could mean in terms of business justification, et cetera. And this is where the business value part of cloud economics come in because we not only help you understand the potential business, business values for your organization, but also help you quantify that as well in a form of business cases or benchmarks. And as you uh, decided to migrate to AWS, then we have our cloud financial management experts that help you optimize your uh, cloud environment or cloud spend so that you are more efficient on the cloud. And we also have, uh, as customer um, um, mature and they're considering expanding or renewing in AWS, we also help customers understand uh, what business value did they actually achieve, right? So this is the value realization part of business value too. Uh, but both of these disciplines, business value and, and CFM within cloud economics uh, relate to one another in that they, um, um, cloud financial management help you maximize or optimize your business values or your potential business values. Um, and we also really just, at the end of the day, help you address all the questions that you have along this um, cloud adoption journeys that you have. So let's move on to the next page to talk about um, this Global 1000 benchmark, which is really the, um, I guess, the background or the study that, um, that helped us to provide with you the, the data and the insights um, that we'll share with you in the rest of our presentation today. So this was a study that we commissioned an independent benchmarking firm called the Hackett Group to do. And what they did was to reach out to 1000 organizations across the globe. 
Um, the, the respondents do have to meet a number of criteria. Um, they have to be knowledgeable of the cloud. They have to have uh, some applications running on AWS for more than one year and they have to have revenue of over $500 million. In terms of what we um, uh, what we try to get from these 1,000 respondents, really to get an understanding of their, uh, their cloud migration, like what they migrated. And then more importantly, we uh, it's a quantitative studies and then we ask them a number of questions to measure their business value KPIs. I'll go through some of that um, a little bit, but uh, in addition to business value KPIs, to try to measure these improvements in the KPIs that they saw from migration, we also asked them a number of questions about the CFM practices, like what did they um, implement or how well are they implementing some of these CFM uh, practices. At the end of the day, we not only got to understand quantitatively um, in terms of their organizational uh, performance, but also the specific application that was migrated to AWS as well, because we asked these respondents, what applications did you, did you migrate, the top three? And then how did you migrate, when did you migrate, et cetera? So uh, we had a lot of data from the study and the results of that, some of the highlights that you see in the last column here is that we were able to then segment these customers into the top performers or top 10 percent and then the rest of the population uh, population of the, this global 1000 um, organizations and what um, that allows us to do then is really um, the rest of our presentation today is really diving deep into these um, top performers and seeing what uh, CFM best practices they adopt and how did uh, and whether there are some characteristically uh, differences between these top performers and the peer groups uh, let's move on to the next page. Uh, here's just um, a high level demographics of the survey respondents um, in that they have to have um, at least $500 million in annual revenues. And you can see the breakdown in that we have, um, you know, a lot of organizations in the billions um, in terms of revenue range. We have respondents from all major regions, um, North America, Latin America, Europe and Asia Pacific. Lastly, the last chart that you um, you see here is the industry breakdown. Uh, so one thing I just wanted to point out here is we really wanted to understand from those heavy users of AWS. So we tend to have more of these high tech and software internet companies that you see um, um, as the most popular, uh, I guess, um, industries that are represented here, which is not a true representation of the, the market out there. Um, and, and so some of the metrics that you see uh, will kind of skew more towards um, these high-tech industries. Uh, but um, as, just as an example, high-tech and software internet companies tend to spend more of their uh, costs on in IT infrastructure on AWS, for example, right, compared to manufacturing um, for those uh, industries of those customers, for example, they tend to spend more of their cost in things like cost of goods sold or machineries and assets. Um, so before we move on to the next page, Lisa, if you could pull out the, uh, the first polling uh, results, which was a question for those of you that joined in the first two minutes or so to ask you, what was your primary reason for migrating to AWS? Knowing that there are, that there could be multiple reasons why you wanted to um, move to AWS, right? So, so it's interesting here to see that um, here's a breakdown in that, um, um, and knowing that this is CFM talks, a lot of um, you are interested in reducing costs, right? And, and that is one of the uh, areas of benefits of migrating to AWS, right? But the, the second um, most popular response here is to deliver on en enhance new product and services. We probably could have worded a little bit nicer, uh, more to be more inclusive to talk about, not just delivering or enhancing, right? But also doing that better or faster and that's really the um, the other benefits of running on the cloud is you can do things a lot faster. You can innovate a lot faster, right? That's really the um, uh, the point of that. So if we could move to the next page, please, um, where um, we will have links to this global 1000 benchmark study that resulted in two white papers so far. So the first paper really talked about the business of uh, value migration, and that's related to that polling question, uh, result that we just showed with you. In that, um, um, in the white paper, you'll see that the benefits of migrating to AWS um, 
the hacker group uh, group these into these four different areas of business value cost savings staff productivities resiliency and agility so the two most popular response that we just saw uh, relates to the first and then the last um, um, columns that you see here and what you will see in the white paper is that we, we went much deeper into each of these areas of of, um, of the business value uh, to measure and benchmark all these um, uh, metrics that relates to these areas. So then today you can kind of see um, um, how um, uh, similar companies um, uh, in, in your same industries uh, have achieved. So let's move to the next page where um, this is just a, a, another layer of these business value migration in that we measure in the second column here, here are just two of the many KPIs under each category that, that we're showing here. So in the paper, you'll see a lot more metrics and KPIs, but for example, on the cost savings, we measure things like um, infrastructure spend, infrastructure spend as a percentage of revenue. Because uh, when we do benchmarking, we, we try to come up with these ratios so that we can uh, combine a large and small companies, right? So when we, um, um, as a percentage of revenue, they have decreased 20% uh, for the overall respondents. But what's really important is uh, for the top performers, the improvements is oftentimes a lot higher. In this case, for this particular KPI, is 47% reduction. Uh, I won't go into all the individual KPI here, but as you can see on the staff productivity, we measure things like infrastructure staff productivity, but also development staff as well, right? Which is more of a downstream impact in measuring uh, whether your engineers or developers are able to spend more time building new features. And, and from these global 1,000 uh, respondents, we did see that they were able to spend 29% more time in building new features than before migration, for example. Um, um, and then under resiliency, we measure things like security incidents, mean time to detect incidents. Again, we have a lot more metrics that you'll see in the paper, but here's just two under each um, category that we show here. And then more importantly, under agility, this is really your ability to innovate and be more agile and flexible. So the two of the several, um, uh, KPIs that we measure include things like time to market, right? Are you able to go to market out faster? And, and the answer is yes, in that respondents were able to reduce their time to market for new application or features by 43%. That is significantly higher for the top performers in that they were able to do that by 59% um, faster time to market. So, so the rest of the presentation, I'm going to pass it on to Lavon to, and um, to really focus on these top performers, which is the last columns you see here, into understanding their um, CFM practices. As you can see here, that their um, um, business value KPIs improved a lot more than the overall respondents. But Lavon's going to walk us through um, what how what CFM practices they do and how they do it differently and and which kind of help correlates with these higher business value improvements. Lavon, thanks, Calvin. Uh, let me bring my video up and I hope you can all hear me. Um, thanks for having us today. Uh, my name is Lavon Stepanian and. Um, We'll be focusing on the second uh, white paper that was published from the same Global 1000 benchmark study. So shifting away from the business value focus part of the research to the CFM uh, part of the research. Um, but before we get into that, I, I just wanted to take a moment and make sure we're all aligned and have a common understanding of what cloud financial management and cloud FinOps is. Um, Generally speaking, it's uh, CFM and cloud FinOps is defined as cloud cost management best practices when applied uh, by organizations help drive more efficient use of cloud uh, and allow organizations to realize the value associated with cloud faster. Um, why this is important for you as a customer uh, or a potential customer of AWS, um, CFM ensures that cost is part of the same framework that's being used to make technical decisions and trade-offs. Uh, it ensures there's a common lexicon, a common vocabulary being used between uh, otherwise heterogeneous organizations like finance, uh, business, and technology stakeholders. And it's a, it's a good way to align um, on common goals, mechanisms, and drive value-based outcomes across these disparate organizations. Um, the four pillars you see here 
uh, are the the pillars of cloud financial management and they are the the pillars on which the study was uh, developed and, and performed and so um, I'll take a moment here to define the structure uh, because you'll see it will you will use this structure through the rest of today's talk so cloud financial management consists of four uh, groups of best practices um, the first set of best practices are uh, are related to uh, planning and forecasting these are best practices uh, for estimating the cost of born in the cloud workloads um, estimating the cost of migrated workloads and really they're all about providing better predictability uh, and, and um, uh, better predictability for your organization and your internal and external stakeholders the second pillar measurement and accountability relate to best practices that improve cost and usage visibility uh, and create accountability for cloud usage across uh, your engineering and, and IT teams the third area is cost optimization, which uh, focuses on best practices uh, to help either reduce existing cloud spend or avoid uh, unnecessary cloud spend from the get-go and includes best practices relating to uh, architecting for cost, uh, using pricing models to optimize and improve unit economics and modernizing architectures uh, to, to take advantage of cloud native um, um, technologies. And the fourth area of cloud financial operations is really about um, how do you scale and run cloud financial management uh, as you increase your usage of AWS. So this refers to things like people, culture, process, tooling, automation, and governance that act as scaling factors for uh, cloud financial management. And before we start looking at some of the results of the study, I wanted to ask Lisa to share the results of the second poll we conducted at the beginning of the, the presentation, just to see where some of the challenges lie for, for our attendees today. So um, cost optimization, it looks to be the top area of struggle here, uh, and then scaling and governance, forecasting and cost visibility. So um, this is good information because the remainder of the talk is going to focus on what top performers do uh, to improve their uh, cloud financial management posture across these four areas. Um, and then we'll also talk about uh, some of the AWS services um, and teams that are available for you to leverage in your cloud financial management journey so that some of these um, areas are, are, are less of a pain for you today. All right, so uh, the first area that the study focused on were best practices uh, relating to planning and forecasting. And specifically, the KPI that was being measured here was um, improvements in cloud spend forecast accuracy. So the study looked at all the data it gathered and tried to find some type of correlation between CFM best practices and where survey respondents uh, reported improved uh, accuracy for their cloud spend. And so the four specific areas or the, the best practices it found were um, respondents uh, performing some kind of systematic trend and driver-based forecasting for their spend, as, as well as variance analysis for their uh, actual spend against their planned spend. Um, respondents who were performing cost optimization analyses and audits and, and actioning the findings from those in a systematic manner. Uh, organizations who uh, have some kind of cloud training program for uh, their stakeholders uh, and those uh, organizations that manage the majority of their cloud spend in a centralized fashion, in this case, 80% or more. And what you can see here are the, the top performers performed these best practices to drive the highest improvements in cloud spend forecast accuracy. Um, the, the trend and driver-based forecasting and variance analysis best practice, it's really no surprise here uh, to see an improvement in forecast accuracy. This is uh, the heart and soul of how you try to improve that, that forecast. Um, but things like cleaning uh, unnecessary uh, and wasted cloud resources um, helps drive a better baseline for uh, forecasting um, practices. So if you're able to uh, remove unnecessary cloud resources, eliminate waste. You have a better baseline to work with when you're performing your forecasting um, uh, and planning exercises. Um, it's not a surprise that organizations that have some kind of systematic uh, training program for cloud, which helps increase uh, an organization's cloud IQ, um, which helps stakeholders understand how cloud pricing works and how uh, cloud consumption impacts cloud pricing, they also saw improvements in their ability to act, uh, uh, act, uh, for, 
accurately, accurately forecast cloud spend. Uh, and for organizations who have some kind of centralized management for their cloud spend, um, they're able to identify anomalies and outliers quicker and address them to, to bring in some of that unnecessarily runaway cloud spend in line with some of their uh, budgets and forecasts. So these are some of the, the activities that top performers performed to drive uh, improvements in their ability to forecast their cloud spend. The second area that the study looked at were best practices uh, that helped uh, two specific KPIs. The first KPI is incremental cloud cost savings and the ability to consistently achieve SLAs. So the best practices uh, that, uh, that the study found correlations to these KPIs include uh, monitoring cloud cost and usage consistently and systematically, uh, monitoring cloud SLAs uh, consistently and systematically, and when we when we say cloud SLAs, we're, re we're really referring to infrastructure and IT related SLAs, things like reliability, performance, throughput. And the third best practice is cost allocation and specifically uh, organizations that are able to allocate at least 70 percent or more of their cloud spend to uh, a business line, uh, a team, a, a product, a, a, a product or uh, another allocable unit. <clears throat> so not surprising here that when organizations and top performers are monitoring SLAs, they're able to drive improvements to their SLAs, an, an 87% improvement in being able to achieve their SLAs consistently. And also not surprising here that um, when uh, builders and IT teams and engineers are allocated cloud spend back to them, um, there's an improvement in cloud cost savings because quite often this is a forcing factor for, for builders and engineers to take a, another look at what they've deployed and see if there's some cost efficiencies they can gain through uh, either identifying waste, uh, actioning that waste, or even re-architecting uh, their workloads. But what was interesting here was that um, monitoring cloud cost and usage drove such a large improvement to consistent SLA achievement and although the study doesn't um, really explain cause and effect here and it's more of a correlation study, what we think is that um, organizations that have any kind of systematic approach to monitoring um, typically see improvements uh, across the board related to things, uh, KPIs related to monitoring. The third area the study focused on <clears throat> were uh, cost optimization best practices. And what this study found was um, top performers typically see a median of 50% or greater cost savings with their cloud costs when they employ cost optimizations. And the study uh, was, uh, what we were able also to glean from the study were the different adoption rates for different types of cost optimizations, as you can see in the table here. So the top three cost optimizations used by top performers include resource right sizing, uh, leveraging uh, pricing model-based optimizations, specifically commitments like savings plans and reserved instances, and using the elastic nature of the cloud or using cloud in an on-demand manner to scale up and scale down. These three rounded up the top three cost optimizations used by top performers. As for the, uh, the next three, uh, we saw respondents um, <clears throat> uh, using um, some of the uh, uh, comp excess compute capacity, apologies. Um, so for example, on, a a on AWS, that's EC2 spot instances, um, respondents using serverless computing or serverless architectures, which allow you uh, to pay really on demand for usage. Uh, and then finally bottoming up the top six is uh, actively using more modern resources that offer better price to performance ratios. Uh, so taking advantage of innovation being delivered by AWS, uh, to help drive down unit costs. The final area uh, of CFM the study focused on was cloud financial operations. Um, and what the study found here was uh, best practices within this space actually improved all of the three KPIs we've referred to in the previous few slides. So uh, KPIs such as improved cloud spend forecast accuracy, uh, incremental cloud cost savings and um, being able to consistently achieve SLAs. These were the KPIs uh, that cloud financial operations uh, best practices impacted. And the best practices of the study focused on were um, organizations that manage cloud activities in a centralized fashion, 
um, a strategic formal operating model or partnership between a finance organization and IT slash engineering slash technology teams and organizations that leverage managed services provided by the cloud provider, specifically um, more than 50% of cloud workloads being run using the cloud provider's managed services. And, and there are some no surprise findings here. So for example, it's not surprising that um, uh, centralizing some of your cloud activities through the use of a cloud center of excellence or a cloud business office helps drive cloud cost savings. Um, this this um, centralized approach helps drive alignment between those architecting on cloud, those building on cloud, uh, and ensures a consistent cloud delivery model for both internal and external customers. Um, no surprise that um, SLA or the ability to achieve uh, SLAs more consistently improved uh, when there's a partnership between IT and finance. Uh, quite often the business and finance is responsible for handling and dealing with the negative side effects of not achieving SLAs, such as uh, generating and, and providing customers credits and refunds. Um, what was interesting was the finding on uh, using managed services for cloud uh, and the impact it had to incremental cloud cost savings, um, improving it by 45%. We think here that uh, the, the work that uh, is performed by the cloud provider relating to uh, scaling capacity up and down, uh, leveraging excess compute capacity and uh, leveraging different commitment pr pricing models helps uh, drive some of the cloud, cloud cost savings um, with respect to this best practice. The last thing we wanted to call out uh, the, the study identified were these force multipliers for uh, outcomes that are driven by organizations that implement CFM. And um, the two that were identified were cost allocation and that business partnership or operating model between IT and finance that I talked about on the last slide. Uh, these two best practices were called out as force multipliers because these activities are uh, associated with organizations that perform other CFM activities which have positive impact on KPIs. So there's a compounding um, benefit to performing uh, cost allocation and business partnerships along with some of the other best practices. So for example, um, organizations that have um, that are allocating more than 70% of their cloud spend are three times more likely to have adopted centralized cloud governance, which we saw in the last slide had positive impacts to cost savings. Um, organizations with uh, higher levels of cost allocation typically apply twice as many cost optimizations and are more likely to monitor cloud costs, consumption, and SLA, SLAs. For organizations that have some kind of a formal model, an operating model between their IT and finance teams, typically allocate twice as much cloud spend. Um, they're three times more likely to govern cloud through some kind of centralized model and are twice as more likely to monitor cloud costs and consumption consistently and systematically. On the rest of this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to double click into the business partnership best practice here. Um, if you've attended the CFM talks earlier this year, you'll notice um, we did have a couple uh, that were dedicated to cost allocation. And, and if you're interested to learn more about uh, cost allocation and, uh, and some of the AWS services and best practices, uh, we encourage you to uh, look at and view the replays. But for the remainder of today's uh, presentation, we're going to double click on that business partnership. And so uh, we call it a partnership, the study called it a partnership. Um, you can call it that, you can call it a, a cloud operating model, um, but the importance of these traditionally siloed organizations working together on cloud cannot be overstated. Um, it's the very heart and soul of the people and process change required to become a top performer when it comes to CFM. So um, if you are one of those folks who identified as an IT persona, uh, an engineering or a technology stakeholder, uh, think about what cloud or using cloud means for your company's finance organization. Um, with cloud, there's quite a bit of role expansion taking place uh, in your finance team. Some of this additional role and responsibility expansion uh, is right up finance, uh, finance organizations alley. So um, things like reviewing and negotiating contracts, paying invoices, uh, defining IT cost allocation models, um, 
whether those cost allocation models are showback or chargeback based, those are things that finance teams, especially IT finance teams, are uh, are involved in historically. But some of the the roles and responsibilities have changed and expanded to include things like, you know, analyzing detailed cost and usage reports for insights. Um, identifying commitment opportunities to reduce steady state cloud spend, whether it's identifying opportunities to purchase savings plans or reserved instances, uh, participating in the development of a tagging dictionary with non-finance stakeholders. So, so some of these things are uh, things that finance is, uh, has done in the past and some of these things um, are, are new responsibilities. And um, just a, a word on this slide, this is by no means an exhaustive uh, table showing the different uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, these roles and responsibilities may differ uh, based on your organization, your, you know, the industry you're in, your cloud maturity, your CFM maturity, uh, whether you have uh, these personas and, and roles within your finance organization. Um, this is just meant to be more of, a, an, of an example of what we typically see through some of our, our larger enterprise customers. Uh, and then if you identified uh, uh, as a, a pure finance person or maybe um, a joint finance IT persona with a bit more slant or bias towards the finance, um, your technology stakeholders, your IT stakeholders uh, are also going through role expansion with the use of cloud. And so in addition to doing what uh, engineers and builders typically do, which is building things, uh, developing new features, uh, fixing bugs, um, a whole slew of other things which I'm, I'm not getting into, um, they have ex expanded responsibilities uh, with respect to cloud financial management. You know, some of your builders are the ones implementing the landing zones or the control towers or your account structures. Uh, your builders are the ones actually tagging resources or building automation that tags resources. Um, they're the ones when architecting and designing new software or new workloads are looking at ways to improve the unit economics of that workload, whether it's the use of uh, new AWS compute types like Graviton2, Graviton3, uh, Amazon EC2 Spot. They're the ones who identify and actually go into the accounts and uh, eliminate resource waste. Uh, they might be the ones who you involve uh, uh, to help with bottoms up uh, cloud spend forecasting exercises. Uh, they're the ones who might be responsible for identifying and mitigating um, different uh, cost overruns, whether they're unexpected or anomalous in nature. And they're the ones that are building automation and tools and governance and putting guardrails in place uh, for cost efficient use of cloud. And what's important here is none of this role expansion for both a finance team member or a, an IT team member really needs to happen in a vacuum. Um, in our hundreds of global customer engagements, we have the privilege to observe and advise uh, on different operating models. And what we typically see is top performers with respect to CFM have institutionalized some kind of collaborative model between IT and finance. Um, here's one example, I consider this more of a lightweight example, uh, where there's some kind of cadence set up between key IT and key finance stakeholders. Uh, again, the cadence here um, will differ based on your organization, um, but you know we see organizations who uh, review unit metric values and perform cloud spend variance analysis very regularly, sometimes even daily and weekly, just because of the, the variable nature of cloud usage and cloud spend. Um, we see finance teams uh, who involve their IT and, and engineering stakeholders in their monthly accounting close process, where they'll do a top-down review of cloud spend, understand um, where all the dollars and cents went to. Um, and then uh, on an as-needed basis, uh, IT and finance teams will meet together to review a request for new workloads that are going to be built on cloud or migrated to cloud to get a sense of how much that will cost, what kind of budget is required for it. Um, organizations who are purchasing commitments uh, and wanting to, to leverage the additional discounts by purchasing them with some upfront capital, go through a capital approval review process, and that can happen on an as-needed basis or some other cadence. Uh, and forecast preparation um, for the finance organization, uh, regardless of your forecasting cadence, um, you may require inputs from your IT and engineering leaders to understand what kind of products are going to be developed, what the roadmap looks like, or how some of the existing cloud-based uh, cloud workloads are going to change over time. 
the important thing with this is um, this kind of regular cadence across some of these activities creates visibility, transparency, and helps set financial expectations in both directions, in both the direction of IT and the direction of finance. On the other end of the, the operating model spectrum, um, we have and work with uh, organizations who have built you know, either part-time teams or dedicated teams that address CFM and implement CFM and Cloud FinOps. Um, this kind of team might be part of a Cloud Center of Excellence organization or part of a Cloud Business Office. Uh, we're increasingly seeing these teams as dedicated Cloud Financial Management or FinOps teams. These teams have their own missions, their own objectives, their own goals. Uh, they have uh, ownership areas. They maintain and groom a roadmap and a, and a product backlog and have ways to measure uh, their outcomes and uh, understand whether their outcomes are successful or not. Um, in this particular example, we've got uh, the different roles here on the left-hand side. So um, stakeholders or personas from the data science world, uh, the infrastructure, uh, site reliability world, fi uh, financial planning and analysis, financial analysts, value analysis team members, all having a role in the CFM team, um, which has as part of its mission, roles and responsibilities for creating cost and usage vi visibility, uh, implementing technical and usage-based optimizations, uh, responsibilities for commitment-based uh, discount analysis and optimizations, estimating costs, and implementing implementing some of the automation we referred to earlier. And all this uh, can be anchored with some uh, program management lead or a FinOps lead that provides the required programmatic support and acts as a single-threaded owner for all CFM or Cloud FinOps activities within an organization. So having defined a couple of examples of what that operating model or partnership between IT and finance could look like, let's take a quick look at what tools um, that AWS provides that, could, uh, that help these organizations and operating models succeed. And what we'll start with is uh, cloud spend forecasting. So this was one of the areas within the study. And if we want to think about how we can improve our cloud spend forecast, we need to ask how can we do a better job with estimating our cloud costs? And so for existing AWS workloads, finance teams can start with cloud uh, AWS Cost Explorer that provides trend-based and ML-based forecasts with a prediction interval of 80%. Um, these forecasts, if they're unable to predict at an 80% uh, prediction interval, uh, Cost Explorer just won't provide those forecasts. And forecasts from Cost Explorer can be done at a monthly granularity or a daily granularity, as well as uh, forecasting both cost and usage. But uh, trend-based and ML-based forecasts for existing cloud spend may not be enough for some customers who want to have even more accuracy and want to model business drivers into their cloud spend forecast. And when we talk about business drivers, um, these could be things like new products that are going to launch on AWS, uh, new migrations to, to AWS, uh, standing up new periphery environments like development, tests, uh, DR environments, uh, increased product demand uh, for uh, existing workloads, whether it's uh, expansion of existing customers using your product or uh, new bookings, new users, uh, and then uh, business drivers uh, related to commercial seasonality, you know, um, different commercial events, uh, mergers and acquisitions, divestitures. So finance teams can actually leverage um, the top-down models uh, provided by Cost Explorer and combine them with more bottoms-up driver-based models using AWS Pricing Calculator, uh, which today provides information for 139 different AWS services, or AWS Pricing Pages, which provide pricing information for uh, all of our services, as well as detailed examples of how you go about uh, building a cost estimate. And so combining the top-down um, and the bottom-up uh, can provide you with an, uh, an improved model for forecasting what your cloud spend could look like. If we want to implement a systematic and consistent approach at monitoring and reporting our cloud costs uh, and usage, um, Cost Explorer does more than just cost forecasting. It is, uh, as many of you know, AWS's native um, cost uh, reporting tool. Um, it will help you slice and dice your cost and usage uh, based on you know, a variety of different dimensions and filters like your accounts, 
uh, your charge types, your product, the region, and a bunch of other filters. Um, it, in addition to having a user interface, it does also provide an API if you're looking to access it and use information from it in a more programmatic manner. Uh, and it's a great way to get started in creating cost transparency between IT and finance teams uh, by saving and sharing reports between the teams. When it comes to cost monitoring and, and being able to monitor and stay ahead of any unexpected cloud cost variances or anomalies, uh, you have a couple of options here. You've got first AWS budgets, which allows finance teams to input custom uh, cloud budgets, uh, as well as um, uh, budgets for um, savings plans and reserved instance uh, reserved instances. Um, you can set thresholds to notify um, custom lists of end users on when these budgets are exceeded or forecast to be exceeded. And with AWS budgets, you can also implement governance by taking action against um, certain types of AWS resources should your budget threshold be met or forecast to be met. And so today, um, these actions include modifying um, uh, IAM policies, service control policies, and actually actioning running EC2 instances and RDS instances. With cost anomaly detection, um, that's the second option you have, is another way to monitor and identify um, uh, uh, cost anomalies and, and stay ahead of uh, cost variances. Um, AWS cost anomaly detection uses a, a machine learning based model to identify anomalous spend. Uh, you can um, define a monitor that will uh, look up and identify anomalous spend uh, for a specific AWS service that you're using, a specific AWS account, a, a cost allocation tag, or a cost category. Uh, you'll receive an alert with a description of the root cause, uh, pinpointing to the specific cost driver. And, um, and if there's uh, uh, an inaccuracy with the root cause, uh, we provide a way for you to provide feedback to improve the machine learning algorithm uh, future, for future anomalies. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder, um, per uh, commitment uh, purchase options was the second most uh, uh, adopted optimization on our study. And uh, in fact, uh, it represents 47% of uh, the pricing models used by all the uh, respondents of the study. So uh, it's uh, commitment-based uh, purchase options like saving plans and RIs are heavily used. And um, AWS Cost Explorer provides recommendations for both of these purchase types. Um, I'm gonna go quickly here. Um, there's a simplified purchasing experience for savings plans. Uh, after you perform your analysis, you can add your savings plans to your cart and purchase them directly from the console. Uh, and you can track the effectiveness of your purchases through built-in reports that help you monitor um, the coverage rate and the um, uh, utilization rate and the savings associated with these purchases. So purchase recommendations helps uh, accelerate finance analysts' uh, ability to identify opportunities to reduce cloud spend through the purchase of commitments. Uh, finally, um, from a centralized governance perspective, uh, AWS offers a number of different solutions, but the one that I'm gonna highlight today uh, is the AWS private mar marketplace uh, uh, feature. Um, this is a mechanism that helps you implement a systematic and consistent third-party tool procurement process without hampering your business agility. And so what Private Marketplace allows you to do is identify products that your IT and engineering teams need and are blessed uh, by, say, your security organization and meet other um, technology requirements. But at the same time, your finance and, and say, your legal team can also approve these products, uh, making sure they're uh, in line with budget and procurement requirements and legal requirements. And once both stakeholders have agreed on these pre-approved products, um, they have the uh, part, private marketplace provides you a way to label these, uh, these solutions in the marketplace as approved per, for procurement. So they actually get a logo that says per, uh, approved for procurement, which then helps you and your builders to identify pretty quickly which ones are pre-approved and, and uh, procure them and, and deploy them into your AWS environments. So uh, wrapping up, now that you've heard some of the top line findings from our study, uh, learned about a couple of operating models uh, uh, for uh, me uh, mechanizing a partnership between your IT and finance organization and some of the tools that AWS provides uh, to enable these successful business partnerships. Um, what's next, right? 
Um, so we just provided you the top line findings from the study. Uh, there are more details uh, and more nuggets. So if, if you're so inclined, we will have a link to the study. Uh, take a look at the white paper. Um, we also have um, the ability to provide your organization uh, benchmarks uh, based on the study. So if you're open to sharing some information regarding your organization in a questionnaire, uh, our value benchmarking team can work to provide you with some benchmark data. And the last thing I'll say is that we have a number of different uh, FinOps and CFM specialist teams that help our customers in their cloud financial management journeys. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about these teams and how they can help you, uh, how they can help you with cost optimization assessments and a new cloud financial management capability assessment for teams looking to build their own FinOps roadmaps and FinOps programs, please reach out to your account team and ask for an introduction to the AWS Cloud Economics team. And if you don't have an AWS uh, account team, please use the link on this slide to reach out to us. And in particular, in, your, uh, in the uh, submission form, mention the June CFM talk and request an introduction to the AWS Cloud Economics team. And with that, uh, Lisa, I will hand it off back to you. Uh, I think we are ready for Q&A. Hello. Um, so we do have a couple questions. One of the ones we had was, what can you do around forecast accuracy? What, it, what, what can you do to help ensure you've got some of that forecast accuracy? What did the study say about what some of those practices are around that? So the study didn't go into much details about the specifics other than having a, a cadence for your organization to, to do that. To, to perform forecasting uh, and mm -hmm. also to, to actually stay on top of actual cloud spend, uh, comparing it to your planned cloud spend. So what it calls uh, and what we call variance analysis. So I think the, the key takeaway here is A, have a process, B, do it at an appropriate cadence. Um, what, we, what we see from our customer engagements is um, a multifaceted approach at forecasting. One, starting off with uh, a more simple forecasting method, like using the AWS Cost Explorer forecast, which is, like I said earlier, a really trend-based backwards, you know, what did you do in the last N months, N days? We're gonna extrapolate that using machine learning. Um, uh, but then, um, that's clearly not going to capture what's happening in your business. So um, if you have a new product launch, if you are expanding into a new region, if you're going to stand up a disaster recovery environment on cloud, right? Those are things that Cost Explorer doesn't have insight into. And so figuring out who the technology stakeholders and product stakeholders are uh, involved with some of those business driver-based decisions and trying to understand what those workloads are going to look like, right? Are they going to look like something you've already provisioned on AWS? So is it a simple thing as doubling the related spend, or is it going to be a, a whole new set of features and services and resource types? And how do you cost estimate those and build them into your overall cloud spend forecast model? Um, so the, the study didn't get into the details of that, but um, that's something that we typically see um, customers we work with perform. Um, so I hope that answers that question a bit. Yep. Um, there was a question about, is there a tool for monitoring savings plan coverage and usage? There absolutely is. Um, in Cost Explorer within the savings plans uh, component of the UI, there are built-in reports which you can customize that help you monitor um, your, your, uh, use, your utilization of your savings plans and the coverage level. Um, and I'll also say, uh, if you want to get away from monitoring those manually uh, through the through Cost Explorer, you can set up an AWS budget report, or sorry, an AWS budget, and specify, uh, say, a target coverage rate or a target utilization rate. Which, when um, when those thresholds are um, exceeded, uh, or 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 your actual coverage drops below those thresholds, you can receive a, an alert. Um, or when they're forecast to be to drop, you can receive an alert. That way, you're not constantly monitoring it more manually, and and just wait to receive that alert, and then that that becomes your signal to to take some kind of action. 